Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Great Leadership. My guest today, Brian Kloss, professor of global politics at the University of College London. He writes for The Atlantic. He also has a brand new book out, not his first book, he's got several books, but the new one is called Fluke, Chance, Chaos, and Why Everything We Do Matters. And we're going to be getting into a couple interesting topics today. Uh, this is, I'd say the book and the concepts are, are part evolution, part biology, a little bit of history, some uh, strategic concepts from leadership that all kind of come together, which is very unique and interesting. So we're going to be going over things like um, chaos theory and how that might apply to our lives and careers. We're going to be looking at the concept of luck and can we shape our own luck? Is it, as the quote says, a combination of uh, preparation meeting opportunity? We're going to be looking at the role that meritocracy plays in the role of business. Uh, can we create our own luck? We'll also touch on the butterfly effect. And we're going to explore who is actually driving change inside of organizations. Is it the leaders or is it the trends? So having said that, Brian, welcome to the show. Excited to talk to you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, so I went through the book and there's just so much in there between, like I said, history and biology and uh, the evolution of the human species and leadership themes. Can you talk a little bit about why you wrote this book and how did you decide to put all of these things together into this kind of a concept? I mean, this must have taken several years to write. Yeah, I mean, it's the culmination of sort of <laughs> a very long intellectual journey where I've I've long thought that a lot of things that we think about the world are just fundamentally wrong. And the book is trying to explore that and try to try to argue that the world is swayed a lot more by accidental and arbitrary forces than we tend to think, and that sometimes very small changes can have very big impacts. And much of the world around us tells us the opposite, because the world runs on models that are mostly linear, which means that the size of the cause is proportionate to the size of the effect, so big things are caused by big causes. Uh, and also that, you know, these sort of models that we have for the world produce this vision of sort of you know, one X causes one Y. And so there's this very simplified version of reality that I think was reflected back at us. Now, the, the actual origin story of the book, in a way, comes from my own life. Because uh, when I was about 20 years old, I was sat down by my dad and he told me this story of this woman who came home to a farmhouse in Wisconsin in 1905. Uh, and, and she had four children and she snapped. And decided in this in this one day just to uh, unfortunately kill herself and kill her four children, and her husband came home and found the whole family wiped out. And the reason I'm, I mention this in the book is because this is my my great grandfather's first wife, and he remarried later to my great grandmother. And so it's one of these things which, when you start to think about the way the world actually is, right? It's this tragic story, but I don't exist unless there is this mass murder in, in Wisconsin in 1905. But you take the story one step further, you're hearing my voice, right? The only reason you're hearing my voice is because of this mass murder in Wisconsin in 1905. Yeah. And so when you start to think about the world this way, where there's all these past decisions from people long dead that we don't even know about, right? Because I didn't know about this until I was 20 years old and my dad told me about it. You just start to realize that the interconnectivity of choices that people make have ripple effects that are extremely long tailed. And that this sort of sense of control we have over the world that, you know, oh, if we just tweak variable one, two, and three, then everything will go according to plan is just unbelievably naive. So what the book is trying to achieve is trying to draw on all these scientific lessons, social science lessons, lessons from business, history, philosophy, etc., and synthesize it into this argument that fundamentally the world is far more uncertain and far less controllable than we think it is, and then trying to grapple with how should we live when we accept that truth. Is the argument, that, and I, I remember that story from the beginning of the book, and as soon as I read that, um, uh, <laughs> it was a pretty nutty story the way that you describe it. And I think a lot of people probably listening or watching this can trace back to some pivotal moment during their ancestors where if it wasn't for one particular decision or one thing that happened or one choice or one question or if the doors to the train, uh, you talked about sliding doors, I think, in your book, right? And so there, there, and it's it's a an interesting, but it can be a very overwhelming thing to think about, where it's like every small decision can have this big impact, right? The butterfly effect. But is the argument that you're making that most of what we do and most of how we got to where we are is because of chance? Do we not have any kind of direct control as far as our 
our output, our learning, our development, our growth, the effort that we put into things? Should we just kind of give up and just see what happens? Yeah, so it's actually, it, the thing that's funny is when you first encounter this way of thinking, the the initial reaction people have is nihilism. Like, yeah. oh, we can't, you know, it's so overwhelming, we can't do anything. I have exactly the opposite view. And that's why the subtitle of the book includes the last phrase of everything we do matters, right? So I'll explain it this way. When, whenever you th- hear about people traveling back in time, right, you, you have this sort of mentality that people say to you. They say, don't, you know, obviously we can't actually travel back in time. But if you were to travel back in time, they say, don't step on anything. Don't talk to anyone because yep. you'll change everything. Back about to the, the future, future, right? Might, that's uh... Yeah, exactly. It's exactly this mentality, right? It's back to the future. It's you'll, you'll, you'll delete yourself from history. So don't, you know, be careful. And what I always have been sort of perplexed by is like, why do we accept that vision of time and the way that everything produces change in the past? And then we come to the present moment that we live in and we're like, yeah, like this stuff is just noise. It doesn't matter, right? Like you can squish whatever bugs you want, talk to whoever you want. All, you know, we get there to the, to the right place in the end. Yeah. And so we have this like juxtaposition of how we think about cause and effect from the past to the present. I think the past, by the way, is correct. I think that everything we do does matter. And so what's what's really exciting, and this is a conceptualization that um, a, a complex systems theorist at the University of Michigan, I'm sort of ripping off his phrase, but he says, we control nothing, but we influence everything. Mm. And, and I think this is something that's really important for leaders to understand as well, because it's something where you cannot dictate outcomes, right? No, no leader could prevent the pandemic from happening. But every single choice that you make in your business, in your life, in any realm that you live in is important. And I think this is actually what I find incredibly empowering. The the initial time when I talk to people about the role of chance and the sort of trajectories of life, they all say, oh, this is so overwhelming. I say, no, it's it's so empowering because there's literally nothing you do that's unimportant. And the reason I say that is because, you know, the, the ways in which we exist, when you actually think about them very carefully, Every, everything, and I mean, like, I mean this in the most literal sense of the word, literally everything had to be exactly as it was for me to exist. Because, you know, without getting into too much graphic detail, you know, the moment of a child being conceived has to be exactly the, yeah. that, that exact moment, right? I mean, if it's any different, a different person's born. So when you start to take that seriously, I, you know, I think it's the most empowering idea mm-hmm. I've ever come across, which is like, Every word I say is important. Every yeah. action I say is important, et cetera. So that's that's what I find really uh, uplifting about the, the argument of the book. So if we were to take the pandemic example, right, because that's an interesting one, could you also argue the opposite of that? Because if you buy into the lab leak theory, right, and you say, well, there's nothing we could have done to stop the pandemic, can the flip side of that be, well, the person or persons or whoever may have leaked it, they could have stopped it if they would have made a different choice. So... You know, let's say I'm that person watching this. Could my train of thought then be, well, if only I didn't open the door or if only I didn't drop the vial or if only I didn't do that, this pandemic wouldn't have happened. Yeah, well, I mean, that's exactly right. So so I, I explicitly talk about this in the book and I say, look, either the lab leak is true or the Wuhan wet market theory is true. Both of them involve one person, right? Yep. Either a person brought an animal to the wet market or the person leaked the, the virus. And you know that's the thing where you start to think about the, the, the way that change happens. And we have all these models, right? We have these sort of forecasts. Everything about 2019 forecasts were wrong because of one person's actions in China. I mean, yeah. no, no matter how it happened, it was one person that ultimately was the sort of per, you know patient zero for for COVID. And so, you know, my view on this is that there's a a much more uncertain and uncontrollable world that actually exists. And I think that it's very comforting to pretend the opposite in some ways because it seems overwhelming to to have this sort of mentality that everything can be upended in an instant. But at the same time, I think we make bad decisions when we start start to have the hubris to think we can control everything. And I think hmm. no matter, you know, the sort of history of the 21st century to me is a series of massive shocks that people think are aberrations. And I don't think they're aberrations. I no. think they're just things that tend to happen in a hyper-complex interconnected world in which a single individual can unleash a virus on 8 billion people, right? So rather than having this moment where we sort of pretend that we can control things and then getting really shocked and upset when we when we can't, I think it's better to sort of just like accept that it, a lot of things are out of our control. But the simultaneous benefit of that is that every influence that we make is important because you know, the pandemic, for example, let's say it's the lab leak, let's say it's the, the wet market, that person 
right? Everything in that person's life was important to get to the moment of the pandemic. It's not like you can just delete little bits and we still end up with the same situation. If that virus had mutated slightly differently, we wouldn't have had the pandemic. Yep. So it just, it, to me, it's one of these things where you start to like, just look at reality in the way that a scientist does. And scientists all accept this, right? They, they, they sort of understand chaos theory intuitively because in, in non-human systems, it's well documented. This is how the world works. Everything's interconnected and these small changes can have big effects and so on. When we start to get to the realm of human choice, because we feel so in charge of our own lives and we feel so in charge of our choices, we just totally ignore this. And that's what I'm trying to do as a corrective, which is, you know, I mean, it's it's an incredibly bold thing for a writer to say, look, I think everyone's wrong about the way the world works. But <laughs> I'm trying to sort of suggest a corrective that might actually help us, you know, navigate uncertainty and also feel more important in a world where a lot of us feel like cogs in a machine. One of the, so as I was going through your book, there was a story that one of the CEOs who I interviewed on my podcast told me, her name is uh, Kathy Mazzarella, and she's the CEO of a company called Graybar. And she's been at this company for several decades. But the way that she got this job was very serendipitous. And she was actually on her way to interview for a different company. And she got lost. And so when she got lost, she found a different company. She pulled into the parking lot and she went in there to ask for directions. And the lady at the front desk said, oh, are you looking for a job? And Kathy said, yes, I am. And she said, well, we're also hiring. Would you like to take the test that we have here? And Kathy took the test and they said, great. Well, you know, you could work here too. And she ended up working there. She stayed there for many years. And now she's the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, all because she got lost and took a wrong turn somewhere and ended up, uh, you know, serendipitously working for this company called Graybar. And that's the immediate thing that popped into my mind as I was reading um, and going through some of the concepts from your book. But for a lot of people who are listening and watching to this, who are in leadership roles or aspiring leadership roles, why should they care about this concept of chaos theory? Why do they need to worry about luck? Why can't they just put their heads down and say, you know what, I'm just going to make the best decisions I can. Like, Brian, this is an interesting idea. It's not relevant for me at all because I'm not in that world. What do you say to somebody like that? Well, I think there's there's two big ideas that are relevant here for, for leaders. One is the idea that when you are in charge of a company or a society or some sort of organization, you have an amplified influence in the short term, right? So when I say that everything's interconnected, I think that's technically true as a, as a sort of scientific concept. But people in hierarchies have much more power to influence events, right? Mm -hmm. And this is where the sort of uh, role of a, of a CEO or a leader becomes so much more important because yes, it's true that everyone is part of an interconnected whole, but of course the influences in the short term are much more, much more, um, you know, vast and important for people in positions of power. And of course, this is obvious if you think about, you know, what a president does. Yeah. Of course, it has massive implications. And if they're in a bad mood one day and they make a mistake, everybody else has to deal with the consequences. The second thing that I think is important is that it, it points to a form of leadership in which you realize that you can't just sort of phone it in every so often because you're setting an example or saying something to someone where, you know, I mean, this is something that I think a lot of leaders are probably aware of but never necessarily see, which is to say, you have a conversation with an employee or you have a conversation with someone who works for you or is around you or whatever. And for you, it's one of a hundred conversations you have that day. Yeah. For that person, it's the most important thing that's ever been told to them, right? And they, it, it radically affects their life. I mean, I see this on a much more diminished scale when I talk to students and they're making decisions about what to do with their lives and they ask me, you know, what to do and I give advice all the time. But for them, they have this conversation like once, right? So that asymmetry means that you are influencing the trajectory of so many people and that all the decisions you make are going to have reverberations that are often unforeseen, right? Now, the, the, the good news is that you have the power to improve lots of people's lives. The bad news is that, you know, even really good decisions in the short term might have bad consequences in the long term because there's just this sort of uncertain aspect of it where, you know, I am the byproduct of a mass murder. So sometimes bad decisions produce, yeah. you know, what I find to be a good consequence. But I think the other point, and we'll, we'll get on, I'm sure we'll get to this later on the episode, is that this also points to this aspect of uncertainty. And I think the hubris around decision making is something that can create catastrophic risk for leaders. So if you start to think that the world is more uncertain and swayed by chance and swayed by these small changes over long periods of time and so on, you have less of a sense that you can simply direct events in a way that is going to avoid risk. And that causes you a healthy dose of sort of skepticism and questioning when you are making decisions 
in moments of what I, what I call radical uncertainty. But that's, I, I know we'll talk about that later on, but it's something where I think this is really, really important to sort of keep in check this, this sort of hubris of control that is sometimes very damaging to have. Did you know that 96% of the people who watch videos on this channel are not subscribed? Do me a favor, subscribe to this YouTube channel so that you can get access to more videos just like this. It literally takes you one second and it helps the channel quite a lot. Subscribe, and now let's get back to your video. Yeah, and I, I think making decisions during times of uncertainty and chaos is a huge challenge. So when we get to that leader's toolkit section, we'll dive deep, uh, dive deep into that. Uh, and I love the way that you kind of position this as a way for leaders to be more accountable and responsible for the decisions and the actions that they take. Uh, so to your point, right? I mean, if an employee comes to you asking you for feedback, whether you're on your phone and not really paying attention or whether you're present in that conversation or whether you put down one of your employees in front of their team or praise an employee in front of their team. And when I always speak at events, I always remind leaders that they have a profound impact on not just what happens in the lives of their employees at work, but also at home. Because how you make an employee feel at work, they're going to take that home with them at the end of the day. And when they see their spouse or their significant other and they say, hey, how was your day? It's going to shape their mood, right? It's going to shape uh, how they treat their kids when they see them, how they treat their wife or their husband. So every little thing that you do makes a big difference. But at the same time, it's also, to your point, it could be overwhelming. Like it's not possible to always show up to be your best in every situation and in every encounter and in every meeting. It's not possible to always say the right thing. It's not possible to just be a perfect version of you. So how do you balance this idea of... Um, Striving for perfectionism, which is not attainable, versus accepting mistakes or missteps that you might make, kind of in the concept or in the um, the context of this idea of, of of fluke and chance. Yeah, so I, I love this question because I think that this is where there's sort of some counterintuitive ideas that fit together here. So you have this notion, as I said before, of we control nothing, but we influence everything, right? And you're completely right. Like you, you get overwhelmed with the idea that literally everything you do matters, then you can't really navigate life, right? You can't, you yeah, can't, you can't it's like, everything I, it's like everything I say to my daughter, everything I say to my team, every, and but it's yeah. like, if I say the wrong thing, <laughs> you could start imagining, well, did, did I erase somebody? Did I, you know, create something terrible? And all of a sudden, obviously you, you can paralyze yourself. Yeah, and that is that is absolutely true. But the flip side of this is that because you can't control everything, and in fact, you control nothing completely, right? Because we're part of this interconnected group of 8 billion people. That means that you also can let yourself off the hook sometimes. Because I think we've been sold this version of control in which everything that we achieve is completely our our benefit. You know, it's, it's due to us. And everything that we fail at is completely due to us as well. And I think when you start to think more about the ways in which unforeseen consequences, uncertainty, and the sort of ripple effects of choices are impossible to predict, of course, you can make the best chance you have to make the best decision. I mean, you, you still want to make, you know, what you think is the best decision in the moment. But you also let yourself off the hook a little bit because I think this is something where you may end up having a really bad day and it might actually yield something really positive for someone else. Now, of course, this doesn't mean you should be a jerk, right? You want to be a nice person and you want to be a good leader. But it does mean that like, because of these unforeseen ripple effects, you just have to accept that you're a human being, you're fallible, you can't control everything, and you just do your best, right? And I think that when we live in a world, especially, you know, I, I grew up in the United States, even though I live in the UK now, but the US has this sort of version of this on steroids, which is the American dream, which is basically, if you don't succeed, it's because you didn't try hard enough. If you fail, it's because you didn't work hard enough, right? And I think some of what I'm saying is sort of like it lets us off the hook a little bit because obviously you should strive as much as you can. But, you know, there's some things that people just can't control. And like that's that's OK. And I think I think there's a, a sort of way in which you can make decisions to optimize in situations that you feel like you have good information in short time periods. You're being a good leader, et cetera. But over the long run, I mean, you know, you're the you're the you're in charge of a typewriter company in the 1960s. Yeah. I mean, whatever you do, you're going to your company is going to go bust, right? So at some point, <laughs> you just have to have some acceptance that like there are some unforeseen things that might be out of your control and you just do the best in the situation with the information you have, the environment you have, and you accept that you're not going to be perfect all the time. So I wonder, like, as you kind of go through that, I'm wondering if that's, I don't know if you'd say a, a hopeful or a good message. or So kind of the thing that popped into my mind, right, is um, let's say somebody's in that situation 
they are trying hard, they're doing everything that they can, and things aren't clicking for them, right? They're, they're not able to succeed. Like to your point, right? The American dream, which is if you try hard, you work hard, you can pretty much accomplish anything that you can, you know, imagine. And so are you saying in that situation, let's say I'm that person and things that I'm doing are not working out for me, that my default then should be, well, it's nothing I can control. It's out of my hands. I should just accept the hand that I was dealt and give up and not try harder because like that message I don't think is very helpful. So I'm trying to see that my family, for example, right? They are immigrants from the former Republic of, uh, uh, you know, former USSR. And they came to the States. They didn't have any money. They didn't speak the language. They had zero possessions. My dad lived in, in, in poverty. Uh, they wrote letters to each other for three years. My mom was in Australia and my dad learned how to speak English by watching the Johnny Carson and Merv Griffin shows with a Russian to English uh, translation dictionary. And so they literally came from absolute nothing. And he was constantly told his entire life, right? That, you know, it doesn't matter. You're not going to be able to do anything. And he, his whole vision of the American dream is what he credits to being able to build a life for himself. And he had every roadblock and every challenge thrown his way um, and still was able to succeed. So I like that message as far as even if you are not dealt the right hand, it's about pivoting, trying something else, kind of going a different route. But I mean, I kind of do believe in that American dream that if you do try hard and you do pivot and you are agile and you surround yourself with the right people and you focus on the things that matter, that you can achieve the things that you should be, uh, that you should be able to achieve. But it sounds like you're you're saying something a little bit counter to that. Well, I wouldn't say I'm saying something counter to that. I think, I think there's a difference between the way that the world actually works and the way that sometimes narratives can be helpful that is, in getting yes. us to strive towards being better. Yes. Uh, and so, so for example, you know, like I, I was lucky to have a really supportive family and I've been lucky with my, you know, genetics in terms of, you know, I have strong aptitude in school and so on. I didn't choose any of that. I mean, I didn't decide to be like a kid who was smart when he was, you know, six years old. And I didn't decide to have supportive parents. So like that stuff was out of my control, but I, I benefited from it. Yeah. Now, I think that humans are ever striving beings. So it's really good for us to think that we can always make ourselves a better version of ourselves. Yeah, that's and what that the whole growth where, mindset concept is all about, right? Yeah. And, and I think this is something where it's, it's, it's true. I mean, you, you can make yourself have an improved life by working hard and so on. And I think a lot of the time this does work. But I think there's also something where there's a corrective to this that I think is worth pointing out, and that's the role of luck. Um, you know, the CEO that you, you mentioned before was the product of luck in a way and, and sort of right place, right time. Yeah. There's a, a study I, I mentioned in the, uh, in the book that I thought was really interesting, which it, it used some really sophisticated modeling based on physics, and it basically set up a, a fake world. And then they had lucky and unlucky events, and they were looking for wealth and the distribution of sort of how luck plays a, a role in this. And they sort of model luck as though lightning strikes, right? It's just sort of random. And mm -hmm. I think that's probably roughly accurate. So what was really interesting is that they, had, they, they graphed the people in this fake world on a, a scale of the least talented to the most talented. And of course, most people are in the middle. That's how the real world is. It's how the model was. And what they found was that, of course, luck most often hits people in the middle. And the reason for that is just because there's the most of them, right? So if yeah. lightning is trying to strike somewhere, it's going to hit the place with the most people. And those people often got very fortunate in life. They got bigger benefits in the model. They would end up as very wealthy and so on. So there is, of course, a relationship between talent and success. There's no question about that. But there's also a relationship between luck and success. Yes. And there's a relationship between a good upbringing and success and genetics and success. And all these sorts of things fit together. And so I think, you know, it's, it's not to say, oh, don't try. Of course you should try. I mean, there's no question that the American dream, even if it doesn't work perfectly, is still a, a sort of aspirational mindset that can help people. It's more that when you get dealt a bad hand or when things aren't working, you're not fully to blame. And I think that is actually true. I think that it's something where, you know, I can't claim all my success as my own personal credit because, you know, what, what did I, how did I decide to be born into a family that was supportive with educated parents who would pay for my schooling and so on and, 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 and give me the sort of emotional upbringing in which I was told to, you know, pursue my intellectual curiosities and so on. All of that was out of my control. So I, I sort of think that this is where you, you can simultaneously believe that there's a role for the aspirational mindset, but also accept that it's not actually how the world works all the time. 
And I should point out that a lot of the CEOs that I did interview, whenever I would ask them, why did you get that role? Like, why are you CEO and not somebody else that you worked with? A lot of them did say luck. A lot of them did say right place, right time. Uh, I took on the right opportunity that didn't, somebody else didn't want. Um, something like a lot of them do acknowledge that luck is part of what got them to that pinnacle of leadership success. But I guess one of the things that I worry about is, and I agree, we should all acknowledge that luck plays a certain role. So for example, I am in Los Angeles now. I used to live in the Bay Area and you know we live in LA. We moved here a couple of years ago during the pandemic. We're closer to family. We have a house that we love. Like we are, like everything worked out perfectly. But it was luck because had it not been for the pandemic, we would have stayed in the Bay Area. Um, we wouldn't have had this great community of friends that we have now. I wouldn't be close to family like I am now. I wouldn't have the support network that I have now. So it was luck that brought me to Los Angeles, where originally my wife and I were basically thinking, we are never going to come back to LA ever, ever, ever. Like that's where our mindset was. Pandemic happened. And then a couple of months into it, we're like, what the hell are we doing here? Our friends moved. We have no family here. We have no community here. Why are we in the Bay Area? And so we were lo relocated to Los Angeles and it proved to be one of the best decisions that we have ever made. We would have never made it had it not been for the pandemic. So I'm a big believer in that element of, of luck and chance. I guess the challenge that I have is when it comes to balancing luck with career success and aptitude and pushing yourself and trying to achieve the things that you want to achieve. Um, I, I mean, I get it if you want to get to the, like the, the pinnacle of success, but let's say for example, you're an entry level employee and you're striving for mid-level management where there are a lot of positions open. There are a lot of companies that are hiring, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for mid-level management. And let's say you are trying and you're not getting into mid-level management. I think in an, you know, kind of like balancing the opportunity versus understanding the role that luck plays. If you have a lot of opportunity and you're not getting into that role, and then I think maybe relying on luck can be a little bit dangerous and assuming I'm not getting there because the cards are just stacked against me. But if the opportunity is small, then luck probably plays a bigger role. I mean, I don't know if you would agree with that, if there's a correlation to that, but hopefully you can see what I'm going for, right? The larger the opportunity, probably the less of a factor luck plays and the more of a role your aptitude and your skill and your drive and motivation plays. But obviously, if you're trying to win the lottery or you're trying to become the CEO of a big company where there's only, you know, 500 roles available for the Fortune 500 company, a lot of it will be luck. Yeah, I think I think. And as I said, I think that there is certainly a, a major place for um, this sort of striving. And I, and I think it is, you know, the, the world is not fully meritocratic, certainly, but it is it has some meritocracy in it. So I, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that this is not something that people should, you know, just become fatalists and say, oh, I'm a failure. It doesn't matter because I couldn't do anything about it. I don't think that's true. I just think that there's a role for small chance events, diversions in our lives, et cetera, that we should acknowledge. I, I love the story, by the way, though, about your your move, because it, it relates to a, a very, to, to me, a very profound idea that I came across when I was researching this book, which is that uh, humans believe they think they know what is best for them, yeah. right? All the time. And there's this amazing study that was done in the UK here in London, where there was a tube strike, so the subway st shut down for a day, right? It was like the, the drivers went on strike and they just, you know, stopped working and so on. And basically everybody in the city all of a sudden had to find a different way to work. So like a few lines had shut down and they had to either go on different lines or they had to walk or they had to cycle or whatever. And what was amazing is when these, when these uh, economists sort of crunched the numbers, they found that like 10% of people after the strike had found a better way to work that they either enjoyed more or that was faster and therefore yeah. they ended up keeping it, right? And so the pandemic for, for you is, is an example of this, where it sort of forces you out of a situation that you think was, was optimal, and then it ends up that you end up in a, in a situation you prefer. And I think this speaks to why it's important philosophically to understand that we don't control everything. Because if you think you control everything, you think you know the answer to all the questions that life has to throw at you. And if you don't, and you accept this sort of aspect of the uncertainty and so on, then experimentation becomes much more important. Yeah. And so it's the sort of trial and error approach. And I think so much of what we're told about, and this is both in leadership and in decision making in general, so much of what we're told is supposed to be the right strategy is pure optimization. 
But the problem is optimization exists only in a world in which you think you know what you're supposed to optimize for, right? And I think this is where the pandemic for a lot of people, they sort of saw like, okay, uh, maybe there's something else I want to optimize for that I didn't realize, like being closer to family or having more leisure time or whatever it is. So my, my, my point is that I think there's some of this stuff where like there's value to the philosophical ideas, even if it doesn't mean, okay, don't try, right? I mean, there's no way in which I'm saying people should just give up and, yes, and not try, yeah. especially because that point that I made before of how everything you do matters. Like, by trying, you're also potentially making the company better. You're also producing ripples that may inspire other people. I mean, there's all sorts of benefits to this. Even if the world isn't fully meritocratic, it doesn't mean you shouldn't try. So I didn't want to give that impression because I think that's quite a dystopian yeah, no, sort of interpretation. But I think the way that you phrased it is actually better. It's not don't try, it's trial and error. And I think understanding and embracing that concept makes a lot of sense. I mean, I can point to several moments, right? I mean, even when one of the first jobs that I had, one of the executives made me go get him coffee and I thought, what the, you know, this sucks. And I quit my job and went to go work for myself 15 years ago. When my wife got laid off working for a Fortune 100 company years ago and she also went off working for herself. Both of those things ended up being enormously valuable. And of course, luck, because had that not happened to me, who, who the hell knows where, <laughs> where I'd be working now or what I'd even be, uh, even be doing. Um, but it's also, you know, there's that quote, and I was curious to get your take on it, right? The, the whole idea that luck is preparation meets opportunity. Where, uh, for example, in my case, um, when I was asked to get this CEO coffee, there were a lot of paths that I could have taken, right? I could have just shut up and continued to get that CEO coffee each week and continue to just drive into downtown Los Angeles and hate my life and maybe work my way through that company and maybe one day become the CEO 10, 15, 20 years later. Or I could have gone off on the path that I went, or I could have just gone off and done nothing. And so I think part of it is kind of identifying the opportunity, right? I, I think probably all of us should get more aware of like identifying what are those pivotal moments in our lives and then trying to ask ourselves, what is the action that we want to take? Because I remember very consciously saying, do I want to stay at this kind of a company forever where I'm getting this executive coffee? Or is there an opportunity for me to do something else? And I worked like a crazy person to try to work for myself, right? I mean, I consciously and put a lot of time and effort, but what's your thought about actually reflecting and identifying those moments? It, it reminds me a lot of a chess game, right? In a game of chess, there are these con there's this concept called critical moments. And a critical moment is when you can kind of feel that there is a position on the chessboard, and I play a lot of chess, by the way, to give context, um, a critical moment is when you can sense that it's a, it's a position on the chessboard where the next move that you make can either make or break the game. Either you're gonna, you, you can just sense that it's a crucial moment and you have to take a step back and take extra time and calculate and make sure that the next move you make is gonna be the right one. Whereas opposed to, for example, in the opening of a chess game, you know, people are just playing moves because they kind of know what the first few moves are gonna be. But being able to spot those critical <clears throat> moments is crucial. Would you say that that is also applicable for our life choices and our career choices and taking a step back and just saying, hey, wait a minute, there's something here and I gotta really figure out what I'm gonna do next. Yeah, so again, I, I'll split this into the way that I think the world actually works and then what's the practical advice from it because they're different, right? So I think that a chess game is actually a poor analogy for the way the world works because those are discrete moves, right? Yeah. And one of the things I, you, you mentioned before, I, I mentioned this uh, film, Sliding Doors, which is sort of, it's a, it's a good concept from the 1990s where Gwyneth Paltrow's character basically in one version of the story makes it onto the subway train and on the other version she misses it and her, her, her world radically diverges. And the reason that's important is because chess moves are deliberate choices where we know things will now change in the game. Sliding doors, which is how I think the world actually works, is saying all these moments that are completely invisible to you that divert your trajectory. So in your case, if the CEO had had, he, if he'd had a coffee before he asked you to get one, maybe he would have given you a better role that day and you would have stuck with the company for another year and your yeah. life would have been different, right? Yeah. So th that's the sort of aspect where I think the chess analogy doesn't fit because we think that we build our lives with all these deliberate moves, Conscious but actually versus, all these yeah, other things I see what you're saying. that are sort of invisible. Now, when it comes to how to actually live, right, because we can't control that, we, there's nothing we can do about the fact that everything we do is diverting our trajectories all the time. 
Yeah, of course, then you want to be prepared. The problem is that you don't know when the opportunities are going to strike, and you also don't always know which opportunities are best for you. Because there's a lot of people who, and I see this all the time with my students, and I don't know how many CEOs have ended up seeing this with their employees, but I suspect a fair amount, where you know I have like a 19-year-old kid who, who says like, I'm certain I want to do this with my life, and they make all the moves to get to that point, and then they hate it, right? Mm. And it's like, okay, well, you were prepared. You got the opportunity and it wasn't the right fit, right? So this is where I think there's aspects of trial and error that are more important, as you said before, but also just understanding that, you know, it's a constant refinement scheme. Um, because, you know, to me also, I mean, and this is something where, you know, this is a difficult thing for CEOs to balance, but I think, you know, not everything in life is about uh, professional success. And no. I think it's something that a lot of us learned in the pandemic was that there were bits of our lives that were going really well professionally, but you still felt really sad, right? It's like you were alone at home or whatever. And you, you sort of, you know, I think this bigger picture that we got from the pandemic does help us make this sort of sense of balance where the sort of luck aspect is not just professional. It's also about having emotional well-being and resilience and all these other things. And that's where trial and error in terms of how you build your life uh, can be so important. And also how you can model that for, for people who are below you to show them that they, they can also have balanced lives in which they'll probably become better employees and also better uh, contributing members of society and so on. The topic of vulnerability is front and center inside of a lot of organizations today. But should you actually be vulnerable at work? In my brand new book, Leading with Vulnerability, I actually say that you should not be vulnerable at work, but instead you should lead with vulnerability. The difference? Vulnerability is about exposing a gap, whereas leading with vulnerability is about exposing a gap that you have and then demonstrating what you are trying to do to close that gap. To figure out how to make all of this happen, I interviewed over 100 CEOs and surveyed 14,000 employees around the world. And I put all of that into my brand new book, which just came out. You can learn more by heading over to leadwithvulnerability.com. Again, that is leadwithvulnerability.com. So before we jump to the leader's toolkit in a few minutes, I wanted to get your thought on that quote of luck is preparation meets opportunity. Because um, if you notice, there's nothing in that quote about chance. It's about sure. you working hard and identifying an opportunity when it presents itself. There's nothing in that quote that says, well, you know, 20% of this is just going to be up to chance. So what do you think of that quote? Is that accurate for people that are out there who are constantly just working on their game? And I guess the analogy that I've heard used is sort of like a... Um, a basketball player, right? The the sixth man, so to speak. They never get called into the game, but they're always working on their jump shot. They're always working on their free throws. And then finally, something happens one day randomly in a game where somebody gets hurt and they need you to step into play. And because you have been preparing for this moment your whole life and the opportunity has presented itself, you got lucky and now you're going to be a star and you're going to shine. Um, does that visual <laughs> make sense or is that complete BS? Yeah, so the, the way I would describe this is there's a great quote about models and it says, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I would say this quote is wrong, but it's useful. And the reason I think it's useful is because it's a good way to live strategically for the opportunities based on the capabilities that you have already. But with the basketball analogy, it's a good one because I couldn't be on the sixth man on the NBA. Like there's not, I mean, you know, I'm not tall enough. I'm not athletically gifted enough and so on. There's nothing I can control about that. But then once you get to the point where you are, then, okay, yes, preparation and opportunity are really important for when luck, you know, shines upon you. So I think that it's wrong in the sense that, you know, it's not just something where success is bred by things that are in your control. It's that there's a whole array of factors that are out of your control that lead to success as well. But once you're in those moments where you're making decisions or you're strategically planning your life, it's a useful framework for understanding the world, even though it's not technically true about how the world works, right? I mean, if I was born in a coma, you could have all the quotes that you wanted to give to me. It wouldn't help me become a CEO. So it's, it's just not true, but it doesn't mean it's not useful. And I think that's where models for the world and sort of strategic thinking um, can, can help us navigate situations. And what I'm trying to do is synthesize in the book, you know, the sort of like, okay, what is the world actually like? And then what are the sort of philosophical implications from that? And separately, that doesn't necessarily mean that we should live totally differently in these situations because, of course, it's obvious that if you have a moment where opportunity knocks, you should take it and you're more likely to take it if you're prepared. Yeah. I mean, I think a good way to summarize the book is to live life more with intention. 
um, to be more purposeful about the things that you do, because to your point, everything that you do matters. And if you kind of just drift through life and assume that, you know, things are just going to happen to you and nothing you do matters, uh, you know, you're very wrong about it. So that, that was kind of like a core message yep. that I took is be purposeful and intentional and present in all aspects of your life whenever you can and give yourself grace in situations when you do make those mistakes. Um, so one more question for you before we jump into the the toolkit section on uh, how to make decisions during times of uncertainty. And that's really around who is driving change inside of an organization. Is it the leader or is it the trend? Because as you know, one of the big topics of conversation is change management, leading through change. But is it the actual leader who is shaping and driving this? Or are these external forces that are just dictating what we're doing and leaders are just kind of along for the ride? Yeah, so, so leaders matter an enormous amount. And I think that the, the sort of pendulum in, in trying to describe change has swung too much to this sort of disembodied trend. Because, you know, whenever we get told about trends, it's really weird how we never get told, like, where they're coming from. Yeah. But they're coming from people. They're aggregations of people, right? And, and those people are being directed to a certain extent by people who are more influential, a.k.a. leaders. So, I, you know, I think the idea that some trend is, is a disembodied thing away from human action is, is utterly bizarre. Now, when you think about this in sort of my world, so I'm a political scientist, right? And I'm not going to go into the... The, the, the highly divisive world of American politics, except for I feel like we could have a whole podcast conversation about that. I'd love to get your thoughts on that stuff too. <laughs> well, in this context, what I will say is I think that everyone listening can agree that the United States is different because Donald Trump was elected president, right? And one of the things that used to happen, and this has an analogy for the trends versus leaders debate, in political science where you know, I'm, I'm uh, in, uh, in, in that field, there used to be this idea of like, we only study the American presidency. We don't study the presidents because the presidency dictates events and all presidents come and go, but they sort of end up having the same sort of behaviors because they're constrained by Congress and all this stuff, right? They have the same foreign policy interests, et cetera, et cetera. And Trump just knocked that out of the water. Yeah. I mean, he just blew it away because it's so obvious <laughs> that the world would not be the same if, if Hillary Clinton had won in 2016. So you, you have this situation where I think, you know, we, we underplay the, the role of leaders sometimes. And I think they're hugely, hugely influential. Um, and I think they're, the, the reverberations of leadership are ones that reshape relationships well into the future, right? And I think this is something where... Uh, it's, a, it's an extremely naive view to think that there's this sort of inevitability about change. I mean, it goes back to that point we made about the pandemic before. That was one non-influential person, right? So yeah. the capability of change is enormous even for one non-individual person in the right place in the right time. Right. Multiply that by you know, a, a, a factor of a daily sort of occurrence where leaders are reshaping the world. And I think that's the way to, to sort of view change, that highly influential individuals dictate change in a profound and, and really, really deep way. And it's not just some inevitability where we're all sort of on the train just waiting to get to the destination. The, the, the driver of the train really matters. Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, that's well said. Um, okay, let's jump to the leader's toolkit section because a lot of people are going to be wondering, well, how do you actually make decisions during times of radical uncertainty, which it feels like for the past few years we have been in, and it doesn't seem like there's any signs of this radical uncertainty slowing down. Uh, if anything, it's only picking up, especially as we go into 2024, which seems to be like a, a you know, pretty chaotic year. So if you're a leader in that kind of a situation, you know, a lot of leaders traditionally go through these forecasts, right? They, you know, maybe project one year, two year, five years, 10 years in some crazy situations, what we used to do in the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s. How do you advise leaders make situations in this kind of a climate? Alrighty, everybody, my conversation with Brian continues. And in the Leaders Toolkit section, we're going to be talking about how to make decisions during times of uncertainty and chaos, specifically radical uncertainty. So if you're making plans for 2024 and beyond and you're wondering, well, it seems a little bit chaotic and hectic out there. How should I be making strategic decisions? What should I be thinking about? How should I be planning, making any kind of decisions? Then this Leaders Toolkit episode is going to be for you. It's only available for subscribers on Apple Podcasts to Great Leadership Plus. So I hope that will encourage you to sign up there. You can also grab a copy of my brand new book, Leading with Vulnerability at leadwithvulnerability.com. So far, it's got a perfect five-star rating on Amazon. So uh, I hope that too <laughs> entices you to grab a copy of the book. And last, 
But not least, if you would like to join the 40,000 members strong on our Substack community, you can head over to greatleadership.substack.com. Again, that is greatleadership.substack.com. And I believe we also have a promo that's going on there as well. So if you want to get access to that promotion, um, you can go to greatleadership.substack.com forward slash GL podcast. Greatleadership.substack.com forward slash GL podcast. That will give you 20% off of the subscription. If for some reason that doesn't work, just email me, jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Uh, tell me you heard this promo on the podcast, and I will go ahead and uh, take care of everything else from there. So that's it for me. Thanks again for tuning in, and I will see all of you next time.